Hello everyone, welcome to Living History. Today we're talking about a topic very close to my heart, it's World War I archaeology. I've been fortunate over the years to participate in a number of digs on World War I trench systems, and I can tell you it's incredible when you get down there and turn over the soil and find what these men left behind in these trench systems. It's absolutely fascinating. And no one knows more about this than my guest today, Andy Robert Shaw. You probably know Andy from his TV work. He knows a huge amount about life in the trenches, about the clothing that the men wore, the gear that they carried, and what it was like to live and fight and die in a World War I trench. Andy also does a huge amount of work investigating and preserving these famous battlefields on archaeological digs all over the Western Front. So it's going to be fascinating to talk to Andy about his experience with World War I archaeology. As always, if you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe, please review. Also, visit us on our webpage, which is battlefields.com.au, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter and keep up with everything we've got going on. Some really exciting podcasts coming up, some really exciting tours to fascinating battlefields all over the world. Let's get on with it. Today's episode, here's Andy Robertshaw. I'm Matt McLaughlin. This is Living History. A date which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terrorist attack. This was their final tower. Andy, let's start with a, uh, a really important fundamental question. Why, after all this time, are we still so fascinated by the First World War? I think because the First World War has a, a far greater impact on most families than the Second World War. Casualties are less, uh, fewer, I should say, uh, than uh, the First World War. And I think the implications for family members are greater. Plus, I think it, it, it actually impinges more on people's imaginations than the Second World War, whether it's films or, or literature or even poetry. Do you think that's because the Second World War was such a, a big and complicated conflict compared to the, the relatively small and easy to understand um, landscape of the First World War? I think that's the point, that actually uh, people have simplified the Great War into a war which is entirely trench warfare. It always rains and everything's in black and white, whereas the Second World War is three-dimensional. It has lots and lots of home front, war front, different theatres of war. Now, actually, uh, so does the First World War, but we've chosen to ignore that and keep it to its sort of primary nice simple elements which is trenches mud rain and black and white well do you think we understand the first world war in the uh in the right way i mean as you say we tend to simplify it and think of it as just trenches and mud especially in this centenary time are we thinking about the first world war in the right way Mm, i don't think we are i think we're thinking uh, uh, about particularly the dead um uh, and essentially 11.8% of British Empire soldiers died, which means that um, 88% of soldiers don't die. They are, they're the forgotten soldiers. Uh, and a great deal of attention has been paid to that unfortunate group of soldiers who are a minority of those that serve um, at the expense of everybody else who came home in 1919 and picked up the threads of their lives on the whole. Uh, and ultimately found that things like Armistice Day meant nothing for them because it was all dedicated to the dead. And lots and lots and lots of people have gone out and recorded all the names on their war memorial and researched them. But the guys that came home, well, they're anonymous in exactly the same way as they were in the 20s or the 30s. People don't know about them. It's a really great point. We, uh, I think we find that in Australia a bit as well. And some really good research is being done about those post-war years to find out 
what it was like for these men when they came home. You're right, we, we don't really think very much about it. Is the same sort of research being done in the UK about British soldiers? Oh, well, I, I'm certainly doing some now, and I'm talking to a television director about doing a documentary on, on the men that came home. And certainly, um, I want to do something in 1919 called And the Men Came Home. I, and I'm not going to call it The Boys Came Home, uh, because the other thing that we've done, and this, this is sort of compounds the, the sin, is that we have chosen to infantize, infantize the, the soldiers. I heard uh, Prince Charles talk in 2006 about the, the young men of the Somme. Well, I went to Menil Communal Cemetery not long ago, and I went round 100 soldiers uh, just on the basis that their names... And, of course, the ages were on the headstones, and I, I, I disregarded the, the, the name, and I looked at the, the age. And at the end of it, I came up with the age of 27 being the average age of soldiers on the Somme. I, I then did the same thing last year with a student who was part of a, a Canadian group. And we went to lots of cemeteries because they, they, they came from Hamilton in Ontario. And he actually was high-functioning autistic and very good at numbers. And wherever we went, it's 27, uh, except for the cemetery where it was 28. And then we moved to Normandy and it dropped to 24. And I think that's the point, uh, that actually they're, they're not children, they're adults. They've made an adult decision, may have been badly informed, but they are not the kids that we sort of want them to be. It's fascinating stuff. I'm looking forward to hearing more about your research because it's something I'm very passionate about uh, as well. Let's, um, let's talk a bit about the archaeology work you do as well, which I think is shedding a whole new light in a very different way on the First World War. Um, I, I think it's interesting because when you talk to the, the, the person in the street about archaeology, they think about ancient Egypt and they think about these centuries ago or thousands of years ago unravelling the mysteries of history. What can archaeology tell us about the First World War? Okay, well, let, let, let's go uh, through that, because I've certainly had people say to me, you know, why do we bother digging up trenches? We know what they look like. Well, we think we know what they look like. Uh, we've got photographs and we've got manuals, and the manuals do not match what you find. And uh, I'll just give you an example. We, we dug a, a system, a communication trench, a thousand yards behind the lines in a village called Ocean Villas. And when we did that, we found that the trench was brick lined and people came along. Um, the, the house actually is a, is a guest house and tea room. And people came along with their cups of tea in their hand or beer and they looked into the hole and they, they told us, they, they told us, oh, those trenches, well, yeah, that, that was done by the French after the war when they lived in the cellar. Now, we didn't say anything, but you don't just go out and dig holes. What we'd actually done is we'd done a desk based survey and we knew that the trenches were actually lined with brick by the 1st Battalion of the Monmouthshires in July 1915. And Edmund Blunden, the poet, talks about the brick-lined cellars of Ocean Villas. So you're going to go, well, what was the point of digging it? Well, the point was that actually the bricks stopped at the, the, the building line. They didn't carry them very far. But the experts telling us that, that, that we didn't know what we were doing clearly were wrong. And what was bizarre about it is we actually found that there was a layer of trampled clay on top of the bricks was well, you might expect that but above that a layer of crushed and i do mean crushed um tiles and that didn't make much sense until i remembered that at seven field ambulance had said the brick line trenches in the village are a problem because the stretcher bearers are coming in having taken their boots off because they can't get a grip in the mud and actually, what we'd found is health and safety 1915 style. Somebody had obviously instructed the blokes to go around and put basically a, a crushed slate on top of the clay layer so people could get a, a, a grip. Now, you put that all together and you say, well, we didn't know that. Who would have known that A, the trenches were brick lined, and B, brick lined trenches don't work? So that's why they abandoned them. So it's an, a, a lovely example of an experiment that, that just did not work. It's, I remember your, that specific example you gave, you gave reminds me of uh, a few years ago working with uh, the No Man's Land team, Richard Osgood and, and his team of archaeologists, and the great work that they did comparing uh, Australian trenches uh, and the training grounds of the UK to the actual trenches dug by the same men at Messine. And the, the comparison was fantastic to see what they'd learned in training 
uh, and then how they applied that on the front line. Have you found lots of examples of that, of, uh, of front line improvements and, and, and the men learning as they go, actually constructing trenches uh, on the front? Oh, yes. I, I mean, the, 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 the communication trenches that we find, I mean, very often uh, they, in the manuals, have really quite well-defined traverses that divide them up. But actually, when you do the archaeology, you discover that the corners have been knocked off for the simple reason you can't get a stretcher down a trench with too many twists in it. Therefore, the stretcher bearers basically say to the men, look, you know, if you're hit, we're going to can't get you out of here. So just spend a bit of time, knock the corners off, and we can get through. And sure enough, when you walk down a trench that you've excavated, the radius of the curve is enough to take the standard stretcher. Um, and these are the kind of questions that people didn't ask the, the veterans when there was the chance. We asked them about battles. We asked them about what it was like behind the lines and that kind of thing. Nobody asked the simple questions, you know, about eating, sleeping, drinking, going to the toilet or stretchers, because they weren't the bits that we were in, interested in. And it's such a shame that that opportunity was lost. And archaeology can bring us back a little bit of focus to the nuts and bolts of living rather than dying in trenches. Tell us about the uh, project you've got uh, that you're currently working on at, uh, at Hawthorne Ridge. We were discussing this recently, and it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Well, uh, since we've spoke, uh, we've done our first reconnaissance there. Uh, there's been a complete scan of the interior of the craters. We now know which crater was blown first, because there's two blown, one on the 1st of July, the one that's filmed by Mr. Jeffrey Malins, the cinematographer. The other one's blown on the 13th of November in the dark, which is why nobody films it. But we now know which is which. Um, amazingly, we weren't able to, to work out why the patch of ground that has been effectively leased for 99 years from the landowners was this odd rhomboid shape until we realized that actually when the crater is blown, the first one, nice circular hole like the one at Loch Nagar and the others, when they blow the second one, it actually breaks into the first crater. And that weakness means that the, the whole of the back edge of that crater is turned into effectively a um, churned up mess which is no longer circular which explains why it's the shape it is but what's really interesting is in the front edge we found firing positions that were prepared by the Germans in the period from the 1st of July through to the 13th of November and we suspect that on those firing platforms unless people have dug down and dug through the chalk upcast Whoever was there, whatever that was there on the morning of the 13th of November, they're still there. Well, that paints a whole new light on the work you're doing uh, with archaeology. I mean, there, there is always a risk on the First World War of disturbing human remains. So tell us a little bit about that. How do you feel as an archaeologist digging in those spots, knowing that there's a good chance? And, and what are the ethical questions that, uh, that, that revolve around archaeology on the Western Front? Well, well, the question must be is, look, we know what's there. Why don't we leave them where they are? That, that's a good, a good question. Um, funnily enough, uh, in the fields outside, the casualties are suffering more than they are in woodland simply because of nitrate fertilizer, which is dissolving leather, metal and, and bone. Um, so there's a, a risk straight away. In areas like the craters, uh, out of sight of the public, because you can go up there on most days and wander around with your metal detector and your little shovel, and you can do an immense amount of damage because people who do that one are not interested in the identification of human remains. They're interested in stuff, stuff they can put in their pocket or collect or take home and smile at or put on eBay. And what we're saying is that it is not a safe environment. The, the environment in those craters are basically now, particularly with more selective metal detectors and more people interested in them and a bigger market, actually under direct threat. So what we want to do is basically, if anything's near the surface, is to find it, excavate it, understand it, interpret it for the public, but if there are human remains, to ensure, and we're working now with forensic anthropologists, basically the same people, exactly the same people who recover human remains from murders, to say, who is it? Where did they come from? 
and then start the process of identification. Because clearly, people talk about the honoured burial. Well, that's fine if you're found and buried. But if you're not, you are one of the missing. Um, and I think for many soldiers to this day, the idea of actually being one of the missing is an, an ultimate horror. This site, we talk about human remains at the site. I mean, the, the craters at Hawthorne Ridge, this was one of the most heavily fought over areas on the Somme battlefield. There, there must be British missing from this area. There must be Germans missing from this area. Who are you expecting to uncover uh, if you do find human remains? Well, I, I, in some ways, I hope not to. I, I, and to be honest, we, we've also done our death base study and we've also done other archaeology. When we did the archaeology uh, up near the Newfoundland Memorial, just outside the uh, fence there, uh, we thought we'd find human remains. I mean, it was the area where the Newfoundland Regiment was shot to pieces on the 1st of July. We didn't find a fragment. And I suspect that was because the whole area of that piece of the Somme is behind our lines from March 1917 uh, to March, April 1918. In other words, it's a rear area, and board soldiers are dangerous because they do silly things. So I think they were given the job of policing it out. So I suspect our dead, as far as possible, was removed. And we've certainly got evidence of search parties going back from individual units to look for people they knew were fallen the people we might find, we suspect, will be the Germans, the defenders, because they never came back. One, one of the areas with archaeology that fascinates me, Andy, that, that I think archaeology can reveal is that we have a misconception about the First World War. You touched on it earlier in the conversation. We have, a, we have this conception that the First World War is a very stale, old-fashioned conflict where it's all about generals in chateaus sending their men marching out against machine guns and they repeated the same process for four years and then all came home. My, my research indicates, and, and some basic thought about the First World War indicates, that there were huge technological advances going on at the time, that the war in 1918 was very, very different from the war in 1914. What can archaeology tell us about those technological advancements and the way that warfare changed during the four years of the war? Well, I mean, if you uh, simply look at what we find, I mean, from early in the war, it's small arms ammunition, on the whole, some evidence of shrapnel shells. But as soon as you start looking at 1916 or 17, then you start getting into chemical weapons. You get into the Livens projectors. You start to get in remains, as we've excavated, of tanks. So it, it shows up in the archaeology. And funnily enough, the, the battle at Beaumont on the 1st of July is a disaster, no question about it. The battle on the 13th of November in exactly the same location could not be more different. Yes, they blow a mine, but they blow a mine actually rather more intelligently. They blow it actually in the dark, and the attack takes place in the dark. They use overwhelming gas, and they use tanks. Uh, and we take the village. We don't get much further, but, I mean, they are chalk and cheese, and they are only a few months apart. And as you say, by 1917 or 1918, then it's a completely different war. What do you think uh, is going to happen in the future? What, what, does arch what, what archaeological projects are going to occur and what are they going to tell us about the First World War in the future? Well, I, I think that what we're looking at now is, is a world where science allows us to do far more than ever before. So uh, the universities that I'm working with have taken soil samples to see if there are any chemical changes actually in the, the interior of the crater. They've actually taken examples of flora and fauna, by which I mean bugs and, and trees and stuff, to see whether there are actually any chemicals in there. But of course, when it comes to the archaeology, um, say 30 years ago, I couldn't find, for example, a, a piece of a human being and say, I wonder where he came from, because clearly we just found him. Nowadays, you can say he was basically through isotope analysis, born in North Germany. He lived for a while in Holland, and then he served on the Western Front before he died here. And that kind of thing is obviously going to be refined and refined in such a way that who knows, we might be able to do it actually on location rather than afterwards. And that, of course, changes things entirely. It also means that people who in the past were simply missing, were found, and we said there's no hope for them, in the future, there's a very good chance we'll identify them.
It's certainly wonderful stuff. We were talking to Richard Osgood a few weeks ago on the podcast about some Victorian remains and the uh, just the, the, the huge leaps in technology that are enabling us now to hopefully, if not identify people, but at least get a very clear picture about where they came from. It's great to see that technology also being applied to the First World War. Yeah, I mean, and the point about it is that that actually the, the situation now is that uh, we're, we're in a world where if you do find people, and obviously you're now talking about the grandchildren or great-grandchildren, uh, although we did find somebody whose son was still alive, um, we're now in a situation where when people are told this person has been a, it matters to them. Um, I, it's, it's an interesting thing that the Americans, who have a, a very a proactive system of going out and searching for bodies, they actually go out and prospect for the dead all over the world, they've decided they're not going to bother with the First World War because it's too long ago. In my experience, whether it's World War One or World War Two, the families are just as pleased to know that great uncle Fred or their great granddad's found than they would be if it was a, a direct re- relative that they'd even met. And I, I find that interesting. I think it is very interesting, and the, probably the, the best example that people in Australia would remember about that was from L a few years ago when they uncovered the mass graves at Pheasant Wood. That was a little bit controversial. People didn't know whether they should be digging these bodies up or whether they should be DNA testing them. Uh, where did you stand on the uh, the, the situation in Fromel? My, my view of, of it was, uh, my first television series about this was called uh, Finding the Fallen, and I asked them to change it to the trench detectives on the basis that you can tell a story without a body. We, we work very well with everything from binoculars to a watch. But they still tell the story of the people. Uh, and to some extent, finding the bodies is slightly ghoulish, I must say. In the, uh, the case of Pheasant Wood, uh, I can see what was wanted, but they were looking for 500 sets of remains, of people, let's call them people. They actually found 250 and they were able to identify over 100 of them by name, which is lovely for those families who had that closure. It just meant that the others didn't get it. So it's almost saying basically, sorry, unlucky. Uh, and that means that some people felt cheated by the entire process. And what was meant to bring closure actually basically opened up a wound. So if you find a, a, a body when you're working ahead of development work or there's a direct threat from what's called, I suppose, um, black archaeology, in other words, grave robbing, then then you can say, well, that's good. But if you start prospecting for the dead, you, you risk raising an expectation that really possibly, well, very likely, you will not fulfill. You will not find great Uncle Fred, even if you have provided DNA. Well, it's caused a, an ongoing controversy because uh, there are a lot of people now who say we should be out actively prospecting for remains and I know there are groups of people out um, doing what they can to uh, to certainly through the records at least explore the battlefields in the hope of uncovering more mass graves and where do you, where do you stand on on that on that situation I, I think that I was asked to, to, to look at this not long ago and, and we were able to narrow down a, an area uh, uh, my view is that if you've got a number of people and you know their names possibly possibly it would be better to simply mark the spot, ensure that those bodies are safe from archaeology or developments, and leave it at that because they're buried with their comrades. Um, Whereas if you start digging kind of random holes all over northern France and Belgium in the hope of finding people, um, actually you may not do that. And of course for the, the French authorities, um, it's something they have to police. You you can't just do these things. You have to, A, know what you're doing, and B, have permission. And uh, I know people have come out uh, and attempted to say, look, you know, the, the, it's my dead relative. I have the right to dig them up. Well, you don't. You, you didn't in 1918. You, you don't do now. I think it's a, it's an interesting point you make. And who knows, perhaps it says more about us today than it actually says about the men uh, who died 100 years ago. But you, you, all, you mentioned development, and this is a big issue, obviously, on the battlefields, on battlefields all over the world, but specifically on the Western Front. And we saw um, at the end of last year the suggestion that a wind farm was going to be built on the Australian battlefield at Bulacore, and that didn't go ahead after, after protestations from Australia. How, what, how do you feel between the, the, the balance between you know, life going on and, and develop, modern development and preservation of the battlefields? <laughs> 
Um, I, I think there needs to be a balance, as you say. Uh, I, I, there, there was a proposal that came from Australia of non-tillage agriculture. And I found it interesting that it specifically mentioned the digger dead. It didn't mention anybody else, which I found actually upsetting, because on the basis that I have relatives out there, uh, just because they're not Australian, does that mean that they don't have the same right not to be disturbed? But the same point is that, 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 that farmers came back after the war and they got on with their lives and they do you know, use tillage. They do farm the fields. And on the whole, they, they do respect the, the, the dead uh, and they are reported and that's important. But clearly, if there is something happening big, like uh, a, a, a um, new road going through or potentially a pipeline, then I think there should be an archaeological watching brief ahead of that. Now, I'll tell you now that, 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 that the people that license these things will make me jump through hoops to get a license to do the work. But if I said I was just simply digging a pipeline, I don't have to do anything. And the roads that were widened on the Somme to improve access back in 2005, as far as I know, and I certainly watched it, there was no archaeological watching brief, there was no bomb disposal, and there were accidents and human remains were excavated, actually some of them right outside the Ulster Tower, which I think you agree is pretty damn shocking. Oh, by the way, it did mean the tourists could get around more easily. And that was the point. So tourism is top trumps to the basically the sanctity of, uh, of, of human remains. It's the great balance. And as someone who operates tours to the battlefields, I'm well aware of this, that the great contradiction between more and more visitors coming and therefore more facilities required, but also the preservation of the, the battlefields that people are coming to see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I think you, 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 I think you, you need to explain to people what they're doing and what, and what, what it means. I mean, I, I saw not long ago people taking selfies um, at uh, the German cemetery, a Langemark, um, and they were standing on a raised lawn. Um, and it was only when I went over and said to their guide, don't you think you should tell them they're standing on about 20,000 sets of human remains? that they thought to actually say, oh, it's not a raised lawn, that's a mass burial. And the people who had just done it were horrified, but they didn't know, and he hadn't told them. You know, I think you, you have a responsibility as a guide to tell people what they're doing. And to be honest, that saying to people when you're at Hawthorne Crater or when you're at the Hohenzollern Redoubt, you are standing on human soup. That's what it is. And you, you, you can't get away from that. Well, Andy, thank you so much for your insights. I, I, I'm, I'm heartened that there's people like yourself and, and, and other people out there who are doing everything that they can uh, to keep these stories alive and to tell us more about the First World War. We'll definitely get you back on the podcast uh, because you've got so much more to tell us than, uh, than just what's going on at the moment. So, uh, so thank you so much, and we look forward to getting you back on the show again. Thanks, Matt. 